Thanks for asking, and I don't mind if I do, because it'll be my last. Oh, no. Get up, Dean. Breakfast can wait. Such a movie. What more can I add to it than just saying indulge, indulge? I do recommend this, The Making of the African Queen by Catherine Hepburn. It's very entertaining, and I'm sure it's available in paperback these days, so it shouldn't be too hard to get hold of. Let me tell you who the publishers are in Australia. That'll make it a bit easier for you. Century. Century, it says here. So, at Century Hutchinson in Australia. They were the publishers of The Making of the African Queen by Catherine Hepburn. You know, when they were going to do the film, both Catherine Hepburn and Humphrey Bogart were a little dubious. Oh, for many reasons, which there's no point in going into now. I don't want to delay us getting back to the movie. But initially, Humphrey Bogart was a little bit edgy about her because she was the, the lady, the, the dignified actress, who had, shall we say, eccentric habits. Well, eccentric to those who don't appreciate individuality, of course. And as things turned out, she and Lauren Bacall, who accompanied Bogart on the location, became best mates. And so did she and Humphrey Bogart. So underlying this movie, there is the development of a wonderful friendship and respect of Bogart and Hepburn. One of the funniest stories about the making of the film is this, that Hepburn, being the lady and not doing the wrong thing, insisted on only drinking water, whereas Bogart and John Houston drank liquor all the time. The result of this was that neither Houston nor Bogart got sick, but Catherine Hepburn did because she drank the water. Now, there's no moral to that, so don't read a moral into it. But the, the stories about the making of the film, including the fact that the African Queen sank at one point and it took them three days to get her up from the bottom of the river, that the river, one of the rivers they used, was so full of disease-breeding creatures that no one could get into the water for love nor money. But th that's, that's by the way. What we've got here is a great relationship. And let me add another point about Spencer Tracy. Spencer Tracy accepted the sea of grass and maybe Keeper of the Flame with Catherine Hepburn gives the impression that underneath it all he's basically lovable and warm and he wants to be loved and he's a bit cuddly. Uh, and he seems to be the one who gives in rather than the Catherine Hepburn character. Here we have two strong individuals, two eccentrics in a sense, once again, two people who learn from each other and grow more because of their growing respect and love for each other. There's a moral in that. There's a lot in The African Queen. That's why people come back to it again and again, because each time it's such... It's a kind of fulfilment, I guess. We shall return to The African Queen in a few moments. Well, what can I say? I'm sure you've had a marvellous time watching The African Queen again. You know, I can remember some years ago when we only had black and white television and African Queen was shown all oh, fairly early period of TV coming to Australia, as I remember. I saw it several times in black and white and it had come on again and I think, no, I'm not going to see the African Queen and I'd start to see it and then end up watching it all, all over again. And that's happened many times with this particular film. I, I guess it's a lot has to do with... Catherine Hepburn and Humphrey Bogart, the two of them together. Many, many people have said, how come Catherine Hepburn didn't win an Academy Award for her performance? Unfortunately for Catherine Hepburn, she was nominated for an Oscar in the very same year that Vivian Lee was for A Streetcar Named Desire. End of story there. But many people think that she did deserve that kind of award for her performance. And some said it was very courageous of Catherine Hepburn, an actress who was now getting older, into her 40s, and she dared to appear virtually without makeup looking as if she were in her 50s, and yet this did so much to really give new energy to her career. And of course, for Humphrey Bogart, I guess the same kind of thing happened, because the films around this period that Humphrey Bogart made elsewhere were not all that thrilling. I'm thinking of Chain Lightning, for example, and of course Deadline USA was never a particularly loved Humphrey Bogart, Bogart film either. Right, there we are, The African Queen. Do you want a few more facts about it? It grossed ten times more than it cost, even though in the early days of production they wondered if they were going to have enough money to make it. And that's where it cost a lot, of course, because it was made in some dreadful locations. Ants were the reason they had to go back to the studio. Ants. There were so many ants and they couldn't do anything about them. 
Columbia Pictures first purchased C.S. Forrester's novel because they wanted to make a movie of the African Queen with Charles Lawton and Elsa Lanchester, no doubt inspired by the film version of Somerset Maugham's story, The Beachcomber. Warner Brothers brought it from Columbia Pictures and decided they'd make it into a movie with Betty Davis playing Rose. And three, uh, yes, three leading men were suggested at various stages. Rex Harrison, perhaps no doubt because he was uh, in The Ghost and Mrs. Muir. John Mills, possibly, and David Niven. Then, of course, while he was making The Red Badge of Courage, John Huston and Sam Spiegel, who produced The African Queen, decided they'd like to make a film of it, bought it at a fairly nominal sum, and the rest is movie history. Here's a little footnote to The African Queen for those of you who are interested in it elsewhere. Apart from the book being always available in one edition or another, did you know that Humphrey Bogart also played Charlie Allnut in a radio dramatization of The African Queen? He played that part and Rose Sayer was played on radio with someone who turned out to be one of Humphrey Bogart's best friends, Greer Garson. I've heard it. It's absolutely delightful. You could imagine Greer Garson playing Rose too. But Catherine Hepburn is the one. Right, having said that, two famous boats tonight. One's the African Queen and the other, of course, is the showboat. The great musical of Jerome Kern and Oscar Hammerstein II. Under the direction of James Whale, who made Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, among others, this film was made at Universal around about 35, 36. It was a big hit and it's the version of showboat that many people think is the best. I know what I think. How do you think it compares with the MGM version of the early 50s, which I adore very much? Well, you can put it to the test in a few minutes. Now, word about next Saturday night. I'm only going to tell you about half the program next Saturday night. Half our program will be a very exciting MGM movie of the mid-30s, directed by W.S. Van Dyke, and it's called Manhattan Melodrama. And Manhattan Melodrama features Clark Gable and William Powell in a very interesting relationship with characterizations about which I'll have something special to say next week. And the lady in between is Myrna Loy. Also in the cast of Manhattan Melodrama, by the way, a very young Mickey Rooney. Manhattan Melodrama. Don't miss it next Saturday night on the Golden News of Hollywood. And in a few minutes' time, I hope you'll love every moment of Showboat with Irene Dunn and Paul Robeson.